No, please feel free to, to join into this conversation, all of you who are here. Um, I'm much more into a dialogic mode than a didactic mode. And I mean, I'm interested in our conversation together because uh, we're all learning. And uh, I, I had mentioned uh, to some of my students that one of the best compliments I ever got was uh, I did some executive coaching and one of the guys was a, the guy who started Nextel. And he came to my class. Uh, one of my senior students was also involved in that. He brought him to the class and he, he'd seen one or two Aikido classes and he came to my class and said, I couldn't figure out what you were doing. And uh, then he came to a second class and he said, and then I got it. He said, you weren't teaching. You were learning out loud. And so um, I would say both from the perspective that, as my grandma used to say, the chickens can learn from the eggs. You never know how what you say might help me. And to whatever degree my time in can be of service to you, that's certainly what I'm here for as well. Um, I don't really consider myself a teacher. I was telling Bo, just a you know, student who's been around longer than most of you. And uh, still very much in the inquiry. But I, I'd say the reason that I titled it Infinite Creativity, uh, and uh, I'm just using that term now and I've used others, rather than Aikido, is because uh, a lot of people have an idea of what what Aikido is. And uh, they sort of have certain expectations based on past experiences with Aikido classes or whatever. And uh, Osensei at the end of his life purportedly said, uh, where I am, this is kindergarten. This is just the beginning. You know, we're just, it goes on from here. I was mentioning, uh, I think Bonnie was in my last class we just had, and I, I had a conversation with my teacher, who was Robert Nadeau, who studied with Osensei. And, uh, you know, he said that Osensei wasn't particularly interested in turning out martial artists. He was interested in helping people become, theoretically, as good at what they did as he is at what he does. And his uh, path was, you know, Budo. And uh, so he showed us through martial arts, but um, he was just saying, there are principles that make me as effective as I am at what I do. And if you understand those principles, you can be as effective as I am when you do what you do. And I said to Bob, I said, you know, it's funny as we were talking about this, because I was working on writing this paper and I'll, I'll send it to you both if you want to pass it on. You can all reach me if you want, uh, armoon at aikido.com, and I'll send it to you, whatever. Or it's probably going to be posted. They create a beautiful world site. He said, rely on harmony to activate your manifold powers, pacify your environment, and create a beautiful world. So that's where we took that from. But I was talking to Bob about it, and I was saying, you know, I always got the impression that you inferred that he wanted us to take the principles and he said, no, he was pretty explicit about it, that he didn't, he didn't want everybody to go out and open a dojo and teach Aikido. That wasn't what he was about. And if you've ever seen some of the films and, um, you know, the Aikido Journal, uh, Stan Prennan did a lot of work with uh, making those available to people. And Bob actually shot a lot of them with his old eight millimeter camera back in the old days. He said he wished he had more money so he could have shot more, but... One of the really great films, and I, I'm trying to remember if it was on the rooftop, but he works with some geisha. And and uh, apparently Bob said he really enjoyed that particular practice and working with those people. And he wasn't that impressed with the guys who were into the hard training and stuff like that um, because he was trying to teach something else. And towards the end of his life, he was, uh, I think you may have heard these stories, Bo, but but <clears throat> I don't know how advanced the rest of you are, but he 
he purportedly said things like people would come to study Aikido and he would say, go watch a tree grow. You know, that could just blow their minds, you know, go watch water go around a rock. And, you know, even in the beginning, I kind of got something of what he was saying, but, you know, I was so into the, you know, getting on the mat and, and I really needed that. I was coming out of a different world and the martial side was great for me. But, um, but so my sense is that what he was trying to teach us was not Ikkyo or Nikkyo. He was using Ikkyo or Nikkyo as a way for us to practice these principles of being more aligned, more centered, how to work in harmony with somebody's energy so we could reflect that back and work more in harmony with our own energy and um, work more in harmony with the situations that we find ourselves in. So, uh, Oh, I see a few folks have joined. I was telling Bo earlier, we were talking about, when I said I, I came in out of yoga, I wasn't a martial artist. I still don't think of myself that way, although I've trained half a dozen martial arts and some with, you know, some of the world champions. I mean, just some great, great teachers. But my interest was always much more, if you want to call it, in self-development. Uh, and I, I, uh, my first love is music. And so when I saw Aikido, I thought, oh, this will make me better at music. And then when I heard that stuff about a sensei saying, yeah, you could get better at whatever you do. You can be more, I don't know what word I want to use here, more capable, you know, um, you can produce better results. You can create a beautiful world in your own way. So that's kind of the work that I'm interested in and being able to respond creatively to any situation. Uh, for instance, uh, all of us have been joking here in my world about uh, you know how good is Nikio against the coronavirus. But knowing how to be centered in the face of your reaction to that, uh, that's that has some value. Learning how to be in harmony with the fact that things are changing around us. The whole world is different. That's that's quite powerful stuff. And um, being able to stay centered uh, through these changes and not uh, attack your roommates or housemates or partners or or just get down yourself. Uh, that to me is what I'm really here studying. So I wonder if anyone has anything they want to say about that. If we're kind of in sync here. Uh, I'm very open to questions. I'm very open to you sharing your perspectives. And I'm very open to anyone challenging or theoretically disagreeing with what I'm saying. And we can talk about it. Maybe we can learn something from each other. There are a couple stories I like to tell, and then we'll get up and do a couple exercises if you'd like to. Um, one is you get out of a movie and you're thinking to yourself, that was the worst movie I've ever seen. And the person you're with, all of a sudden, before you can say anything, says, God, wasn't that a great movie? And they're really cute. Or it's your boss, or it's your Aikido teacher. Or it's, what do you do at that point? How do you deal with that situation? And my feeling is, you know, of course, the obvious reaction is to say, no, you're an idiot. It was a crummy movie. Or you kind of disassociate from your own experience, go, yeah, yeah, it was, you know. Whatever it is, any way you end up in that situation is basically a lose, as far as I'm concerned. But where does that come from, that somebody needs to be right and somebody needs to be wrong? Uh, Osensei said, Aikido doesn't call relative affairs good or bad, but keeps all beings in a constant state of growth and development and serves for the completion of the universe. And so I'd say that the right response at that point is... pausing to give you a creative moment here. I would say I'm glad you liked it. Exactly, exactly. Let's start to explore what it was that you saw that you were able to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I may not agree with you, but I'll learn something about who you are. And maybe you'll teach me to see something that I missed. I was so busy in my whatever, that we could take these differences in our opinion and grow together. And uh, what I'd say is the more comfortable you are with yourself, the more 
in harmony with the totality of yourself you are, you don't need to get into those situations. Now let's go back to how do we get to that state? All right, here's, here's the next one. Um, these are kind of what we might call thought experiments before we get into something a little more physical. And it'll be gentle, but we'll get up and move a little bit if you'd like to. Um, you're about to go to dinner. Uh, you're going to meet this couple who doesn't get along well. So I just want you to notice the reaction in your body or your somatic awareness or your feeling, how you feel about that. As a matter of fact, they're always at each other in some way. They're just, they just, they, they just don't get along. They're always kind of fighting. They're always putting each other down or whatever that, that tonality is. So if you just sit with that for just a second and then compare it with the idea that actually uh, they couldn't make it, but the other couple that gets along really well is going to have dinner with you tonight and how you feel about that. And I, I pause for a moment so if anybody wants to comment on this, I'm happy to hear what you have to say. I mean, is it all about just maintaining an open mind no matter what the situation is or? Well, I would say that that's true, but, but there's also a matter of, um, did you ever hear the phrase from O Sensei, love gives birth to harmony. And harmony brings forth joy. And joy is the greatest treasure. No, I've not, but thank you. That's actually very useful. It's a beautiful one, isn't it? Yeah. He, said, he said things like, that. it's not material possessions, it's the spirit that you live in. Can, can you give me that quote one more time, please? Absolutely. And if, if you want, it's up on the... The, I have a channel called the Moon Sensei channel. It's Aikido in 3Z Lessons by O Sensei, or O Sensei's Aikido in 3Z Lessons, in case you forget it. But Thank you. It's love gives birth to harmony, and harmony brings forth joy, and joy is the greatest treasure. And so I come back and say, if we value joy, uh, let's just carry the little thought experiment out another notch. Uh, so am I safe in assuming that when everybody heard that they were going to dinner with a couple that didn't get along well, there was a little less joy in your somatic experience? And um, when you thought about going to dinner with a couple that did get along well, there was a little more joy in your somatic experience. Is that is that fair? Is that a fair way to say it? Are we on the same page here, as they say? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Although on, it, on my end, it was a cognitive process. I thought I'm going to have to work less. Yeah. Yeah. I'm yeah. with that. I, I wouldn't say joy. I would say the first one had apprehension and the other one had ease. Kind of like, you know, for some reason, the example came to my mind of doing Ikkyo wrong, trying to muscle it versus trying to flow with it. When there's the, the, the unhappy couple, it's like you got to muscle through the situation. If it's, an, you know, a couple that gets along, you can just kind of flow with it and be easy. Well, I think if you can catch the, the feeling, and I think apprehension and, and ease are good words, uh, you know, joy and uh, discomfort might be other words. I'm sure a couple of you have some other words you might care to share or that you're thinking to yourself. But here's, here's what I'd say on a certain level is you probably weren't as interested in going to dinner with a couple that didn't get along well. You probably weren't looking forward to it as much. And I don't mean to make too much out of this, but I don't think I can make enough out of it because here's what this is all about, folks. Um, everyone was made from a mother and a father. Everyone has within themselves the masculine and the feminine that combined to create life. I'm still good because if I'm not, stop me before I get too far. So if we recognize that we are made up of masculine and feminine, that what I'd say is, is when your masculine and your feminine aren't getting along too well, 
we don't want to go to jail with you either. And when your masculine and your feminine are getting along really well, when they're loving, uh, you know, then we'd like to hang out with you. Does that resonate for everybody? And then what I'd say is when my masculine and feminine are getting along, I don't even want to go to dinner with myself. <laughs> so what's the game? How do we put this together now? If we're, if we're kind of in sync and like I say, stop me with a question or slow me down or challenge thinking, or let's make sure we, we have a good dialogue here that, that leaves us all in a place where after we're done being together, all of us get to think more openly and more in a state of wonder and inquiry about what it is we're studying. I said to Bo, we had a, a really nice conversation the other night, and I was saying to him, you know, how many of us are going to get in sword fights? But most of us who practice Aikido probably learn some sword moves or something. And what is it that we're really studying here? So let me give you a, one more little game, and then we'll stand up and do some movement for those of you who'd like to. And you can feel free to do the exercise of sitting or just watch whatever's right. But um, if I ask you to take a deep breath, would you please? And exhale. Let's do it once more just to make it really obvious, okay? Everybody understands that they're breathing. If I said, is that you breathing? You'd say, yes, that's me breathing, right? We know that's breathing. We know that's you doing it. No question, no problem. Now, if I said, okay, now don't do anything to inhibit your breath, but just don't breathe for a minute. Probably by about now, everyone notices, yep, you're still breathing. Is that you breathing? Or was the other one you? Or which you am I talking to when I'm talking to you? So here's what I want to give you as your first exercise. And if I were only to have one thing I could give you, this is what I would give you. Listen to the impulse to breathe. You feel your state of being change almost immediately, and if not, within three or four breaths. And again, I, I have my little joke about it. Um, not just like notice that, oh yeah, that's right, there's an impulse and it's breathing me. I don't mean that. I mean, when it wants you to breathe in, breathe in with it. That same you that was doing when I asked you to breathe in and out, start to unify those two by listening to the impulse to breathe in. So like I said, I don't mean just noticing it. I don't mean just hearing that it's there. There were a lot of things my, my parents told me to do and I heard them. I just didn't listen. Okay. So listening to the impulse to breathe with that spirit, that it's actually trying to communicate a message to you. It's trying to bring you into a universal harmony, a universal rhythm a feeling of connection to something larger than the you that you know yourself as. And like I say, is that you or isn't it you? Well, now we don't know what the words mean anymore. We're, we're playing with the idea. So phase one, first thing, most important thing, you're in a crisis situation. And this is not when, uh, you look up and there's somebody with a beer bottle coming down on your head. You're a little late by then, but okay, you're going to do whatever you're going to do. Um, but the next time you start to get into a moment of apprehension about the future, uh, an argument with your dog or your wife or your husband or your children or your boss or your coworkers or your friends, see if you can remember this little exercise. And I'd say even take a minute and just imagine, go back to the last difficult conversation that you had and look at yourself in that situation and how you reacted and how you were feeling and how that caused you to speak to the other person or think to yourself. And then imagine if you could rerunning that same tape, except you get to pause for a minute and do this exercise. Okay, so I can't, it's so simple. It's so, 
sort of nothing, but I can't emphasize to you enough how powerful this connection is. And it's simply an exercise that helps you do what we're talking about is bringing your masculine and feminine, your known and your unknown, your mind and your body, however you want to talk about the aspects of being, bringing them into a unified field or what I believe Osensei meant when he talked about standing on the floating bridge that connects heaven and earth, that allows you to be in both places at once. The you that you first took a breath and that other you start to connect and become one. Got the game? Doing okay so far? Questions? Problems? So stay with that as much as you can. Everything else we talk about, and whenever you can, return to that until... It's like riding a bike. You don't even think about it anymore. You just, you're always connecting those two and you're operating from that unified field of being. Uh, and I would say, if nothing else, run a couple movies in your imagination and see if it seems like the practice is worth doing. If it is, do it. If it isn't, don't. Never disconnect with your inner teacher. Don't take anything on my authority. These are just my stories. You have to I have a question. I'll just say, you have to experiencing, experience them yourself to find out if they're true for you. Please. Uh, so, I don't know, Just maybe it's just because you said you were a musician. It kind of reminded me of the point where, like, you're learning an instrument and you have to, like, think to breathe in between the notes. And then as you kind of pick it up, you stop thinking about the breathing. You just let the breathing happen naturally. And you can kind of work it into the – in between, like – the notes is it that kind of like effortless it just happens thing and you're you're kind of subconsciously aware of it or is it more just like it's just like you just sink into like effortlessness because in my mind those are different things say the last sentence again please like is it is it where you just sort of let go and sink into kind of the rhythm of what the music is or is it just kind of like a natural thing where your brain shuts off? Um, if we were going to see each other again, I would say to you, play with that. And let's talk about it after you've spent a week or, or so doing that experiment for yourself. Okay, well, I can do that for sure. But in the, in the short time that we have, let me, let me offer what I think I hear in your question, and you can let me know if we're uh, satisfying the, the inquiry enough for you to go forward with your own experiment. But what I would say is um, I play classical guitar. Uh, I used to play classical guitar. I haven't played it in years. And then last year I started trying to practice it again. And I have these moments where I actually am getting back into it enough that I, all of a sudden I realized I'm at the end of the piece and I didn't even, wasn't even conscious of it. So I would say, that's good. It's better than the one where I'm efforting and struggling and, you know, fighting with it. But it's not the same as when I'm there playing mm. and bringing my, do I call it emotion or feeling? He answers my feeling. question completely. Because, right. oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well, no, just that, that, cause that's one where, yeah, in the beginning you get to that, you have to struggle with it. And then there comes a point where you can do it and you don't have to think about it. But that's also like a, like that's a level of technical skill, but it's also lacking engagement. And I think what you're, I agree. I want to make sure that that is what you're talking about. Of You have that technical skill where you can, but you are also engaged or is it just when you get to the point where you have that technical skill that your brain can shut off, that alone is what you're talking about? Like, I, I wasn't sure. No, I, I, think, I think we're in sync. And I think if you play with the experiment coming back to the breath, that if you um, notice what's happening when you're listening mm. to your breathing, when the you that whatever, when I asked you to breathe and the you that was breathing anyway, start to connect with each other, that's very different than just breathing unconsciously, effortlessly, and you're not paying any attention to it, but you're still doing it. And I think if that helps at all, that it's 
There's something very vital about who you are and your joy that comes through your playing. That's why um, probably the best picture of it is Isaac Stern in China. If you've ever seen that, mm -hmm. uh, he's a violinist. I think you may know, but uh, he goes to China and in China, they're taught to play technically perfect music, but he teaches them to play with feeling. It's, it's worth seeing the movie just to catch the question that you're asking. Mm. At any rate, I think if we're good enough. No, that was excellent. Thank you. Thank you. And so I would say the next step in this listening to the impulse to breathe, and like I say, not just hearing it, not just knowing it's there, not just uh, like the Zen people do, watching your breath, all good, all good, uh, but actually listening to it as if it was critically important that you breathe in perfect harmony with that impulse not straining and stressing trying to do it, but just that there was tremendous value, tremendous joy, which I think you will feel as you start to do that exercise. The second step of that is um, seeking the source of the impulse to breathe. And this can be a bit of a Zen koan, and a lot of people could go mental or, or thinky about, let's see, where does that come from? That's not what I mean by seeking the source. What I mean is seeking the source, feeling the origin of that impulse. So let me give you that two-phase practice and say, if, if you don't remember anything else from our time together, and if you want to practice something in terms of what I think I could give you that's a value, that's what I offer you. Um, it's not worth much unless you actually practice it but it doesn't take that much practice until it does be kind of become kind of proprioceptive or whatever you're describing where you play it without thinking you're, you're not working to remember to do it. You're always coming back to that feeling of a unified feel of standing on the floating bridge. I think most of you have done exercises where uh, somebody tries to lift you up. There, nobody, anybody missed it, that piece of it. Uh, all those practices where you've shifted into a different state of being, uh, different dimension of presence. Uh, that's this unification, this floating bridge approach. And as all of it comes together, what I call the unified field of being, uh, you hit that place where you're quote unquote unmovable or unliftable, or they can't bend your arm, or your technique is so effortless that you don't literally have to touch them. It's like I say, every technique should be kokinage. And let's come back to that one. You ready to stand up? If you'd like to. Um, and like I said, I think you can play these exercises sitting. But here's what I'd say first. And I'm going to run through these pretty quick. Let me take a quick peek at our, our time here. We've got about half an hour. huh? Um, but again, uh, if you lose it, if you need help with it, get back in touch with me. I'll, I'll give you some ways to, to bring it back. But I think if we just do a quick lean forward a little bit, feel it, come back, lean back a little bit, come back, lean forward a teeny little bit, come back, lean back a teeny little bit, come back. Now my question would be, when I say come back and you find that place, and I didn't use the word center, but I'm sure most of you were thinking that, but just whatever that place is, is not an idea of center, it's a feeling that you have. How do you know you're there? Or what's the first thing that you notice? Please. It doesn't take- and do it again so you can- It doesn't take any effort to stay yeah. there. It's it's like a it's like a ball falling into a to a little socket, right? The ball rolls forward and it goes into the socket. If it goes too fast, of course it'll it'll pop out of that. But just at the right moment, it, it sinks. It's like your alignment. Everything comes into alignment. I, that's what happens to me. I mean, it, it's it's all here. I feel it all here. Perfect. That's a beautiful picture. I feel like, like a balanced wave. And when I get in the zone, I actually feel the energy uh, around my heart center start to get hot and heat up. 
you guys are advanced, I can tell. So uh, what I would say to you is once you hit center at what I call aligning in my meditation microdosing practice, uh, when you align so that the, in effect, the skeletal structure takes the weight of the body, I'm going to get a little mechanical here, but I hope you can stay in the spiritual realm and the mechanical realm at the same time, and you're still listening to the impulse to breathe and seeking its source. When you start to hit center, automatically... The network outage is also great, tying it back to what he said in the beginning about going outside and watching a tree grow. Yeah, 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 yeah. So um, as you hit that place where your skeletal structure is aligned with the force of gravity or you're connected with the center of the earth, if we want to talk at a bigger level, your muscles can naturally relax. Mm -hmm. The one we didn't get to, but you'll notice if you do the practice again or enough times, the other thing that happens is you start to breathe. And you realize in this off balanced place, you're not breathing as freely. And you hit here and it's just kind of a, that's why I like the breath at the basic. And that thinking into a spot, that was beautiful because as you relax your muscles, you start to ground more. Yep, yeah, that's get really me kind of a thing. Um, for me, anyway, I, I, I can't, be, of course, be rigid. I, I have to allow that ball fall into the socket and my knees are soft enough to let that sink. It's not a whole lot, but that's the feeling. Well, for, for most of us, there'll be actually, and I think it was Linda who said something about the, starting to feel at another level, the heart or whatever activates that the way I would describe this track is the center, ground, flow. And what I want to say to you is it's not really so much something you have to do. As soon as you sort of start the process of aligning with who you are, being able to say to someone, you know, I didn't really like the movie. I wondered why you liked it, not I didn't like it, you're an idiot. Okay. So this place of center, ground, flow, and you naturally have this energy moving because you're allowing it. And the other piece, once you've aligned and allowed, I'd say it's appreciate, which means bring your attention to connect with your experience, connecting your attention with your experience. And Liveness or vitality there. The reaction for a lot of us at that point is we'll start to get this tendency to want to move a little bit because the energy is starting to move a bit. Uh, although sometimes you'll get there and the opposite will happen. You'll get there and it'll just like everything will settle down like the ball sinks into the hole and it just, you get that other kind of stillness. But if you stay with it a little bit, let's do, I'm going to move along again a little quickly here, but I think if you've got this basic center, ground, flow, if we were going to do Aikido at this point, we would blend with our partner's energy. And really what we're doing now is blending with our energy, which is like we saw when we first breathed and then breathed again. It's a little more than where we started. We start blending with more and more energy. And we start to feel that we're more than we knew that we were. And that's what O-Sensei, I believe, was saying to us, you know, you have much more to offer. Uh, Einstein, you say we use 5% of our brain a little bit like that. We, we could bring the whole being to bear. All right, so let's activate the left side, or I guess in this case, it looks like the right side to you, and the other side for a minute. And then just feel that one side a little more and then feel this side a little bit more. Then feel both of them for a second, start coming into that center line that connects the two. And then do a little left and a little right again. And coming back in until you hit that place again where it's, and then I, will, I would in my semi-humorous way say, is that both sides or is that neither side? That blade's edge, is that both sides of the sword or is that neither side of the sword? And then I would also say in our floating bridge metaphor of both heaven and earth, yeah, what if it were both at once? You were both 
all the outer extremities and you were the central point all at the same time. Okay? Now, if you combine that with your listening to the impulse to breathe while you're doing your centering, tell me, does that take you another notch into this feeling of shifting awareness? How you feel starts to change. There's greater ease, there's less anxiety. There's more allowing, there's less forcing. There's more accepting, there's less resisting. Are, are we in the ballpark? Everybody working good here? So this state of being, listening to the impulse, standing on the floating bridge, uh, centered, grounded, flowing. This is a different state than we're in most of the time. Or let's say it's a degree different. We're probably always, you know, somewhere near center and while we're having our anxious moments and our avoidance moments, we're passing through center at moments, but it becomes a much more conscious place to operate from. And I think that you can tell if you were going to, let's use push a refrigerator into place, you know, you wouldn't want to do it from an off-centered place. You want to get it centered as a line and, and let the energy come through. You wouldn't want to be tight. You'd want to be, and if you could, then maybe you'd even like to enjoy it as a practice and get into that state where it, the power of your being is flowing through. It's not another stinking job you have to do. It's a chance to tap into your base. It's a chance to play. Bob used to do this series of cartoons, you know, of a, a guy, whatever, moving bricks or doing whatever, bitch mumble bright, and another guy at the gym going, God, I love this pumping iron. They're both doing the physical thing, but it's the state of mind that you're doing that exercise from. So, we okay? All right, so I'm going to call this state standing on the floating bridge. And I'm going to say that if somebody were to come up and push me now, uh, if I'm not there, then they, they'd absolutely disturb my balance. But once I just start the breathing, you almost don't need to know this other stuff. But add in that front, back, left, right, whatever. And they come and push me down. They're going to have to push a lot harder to move me. And I tell the story about uh, my brother was in an accident. He was uh, recovering. He was in a wheelchair and wanted to go out to the bar. I took him out to the bar to get this piano player. And a big guy comes up and starts, this guy was obviously screwed up, starts hassling him. And I'm not sure where it's going to go. And I just pretend like I'm watching the music and I kind of, like I'm really interested in the guy up on stage, I insert myself between them. And the guy starts kind of, like he's dancing, he's just bumping into me. And I just do my, and so instead of him doing this to me, as he goes to bump me, he's whatever. And he can't get me to spark or respond, he's just, and eventually he goes away because I didn't give him any negative energy and yet he couldn't intimidate or whatever me in that space. And so being in this place when you need it, these techniques, front, back, left, right, center, center, allow, relax, let the connection to the ground. And I, I'm, I'm running out of time here to go into some more of this, but I did speak in the last class about if you can picture like I said, the way, you know, when the sun shines on you, you leave a shadow. If you could picture the gravity of the weight of your body producing a shadow into the earth itself, like where's that weight going? And you can feel into that, you have a very different stance, a very different state of being, right? So I think, let me just check the time here. Yeah, let me do just a couple more minutes then we'll talk for a few more minutes and wrap it up. Here's what I like to play with is this state of being, and then I use my Aikido practice to represent any issue that you're facing. Uh, could be getting along with someone, could be uh, financial challenges, it could be, uh, you know, dealing with what you're going to do with your life, it could be just fixing dinner or fixing your car. It doesn't matter what the challenge is, there's 
things that come at you that you have to handle. And in Aikido, we usually practice those with an attack. Somebody grabs us, somebody punches us, or a showman strike, which I say, you know, no one's going to do that in the modern world, but grab the beer bottle off the bar and uh, there's a showman strike in America or wherever, you know, the West. Um, so let's do, uh, you know, something like a showman strike, but a straight line coming down towards us and let's move off the line. Okay, so you got an imaginary uke, you set it up. Let's have them be uh, courteous and kind of slow. And we'll just move off the line. All right. And while we're doing it, let's go ahead and bring our hand up. So their hands coming towards us, our hand just brushes it slightly to the side and protects us. Okay, it's almost as if you're going to just wipe the side of your face a little bit, but just sends their hand by you as you move off the line. Very simple move. Got it? All right, let's do the other side. Just, just cut it. Just. Okay, and, and again, it's not your block karate style. It's, it's just a blend going the direction their strike is going and just, can I use the word tangentially, moving them just slightly off the line, even though you already moved so they miss you. But as you Bring your hand in contact with them that way. You start to connect with their energy and you feel it. Sensei, I, I think you have more time than than you know. You have um, at least 45 minutes, and Bo extended it another half hour. So if you even wanted to go to 8, that's a, a possibility. You have till 7.30 oh. or, or 8. Oh, oh okay. Yes. So you have, you have plenty right. of time. If you all are interested and we're having a good time, we can go a little longer. That's, that's, I thought it was an hour, and I'm, I'm prepared to go as long as, you know, you're all saying, yeah, let's keep doing this. Yeah, let's so, keep doing it. This 90, is good. Minutes. Thank you. All right. So, no pressure, though. <laughs> good. All right, so we're doing this simple movement. And generally speaking, and let me guess, let's go back to the first side again. And again, it's, it's, it's surprisingly gentle how little... It takes, and if I had an uke here, I'd show you with the sword, how little it takes to deflect that sword so it misses you as opposed to coming straight down the line. How little it takes. And that sense of ease and whatever that we were talking about. But here's what I'm going to guess. Let's all set up, if you're up, up a mind for it, and do the movement. And then what I say is, are you feeling your breath? Are you feeling the impulse to breathe? Are you seeking the source of the impulse to breathe? And, you know, I'm not really looking for uh, doing so much as that attitude of connecting to that original self. Are you feeling your weight into the earth? Are you feeling your centeredness, your front, back, left, right? Are you feeling that? Because usually, I don't know how you are, but I, all I have to do is go cut lettuce or something. I mean, that, you know, and I'm tensing up with the knife and I'm more than I should be. So that's what Bo was asking me about. Why does it say minus 10%? Because when I'm sitting there cutting butter or whatever, uh, I try and take off 10%. And I take off another 10% until I'm really using the right amount of energy for the situation because most of us tend to tense toward accomplishing whatever we're doing. And I'm going to say even this simple little move, and even though there's no one there, I'm going to guess a little bit of that's happening if you're with me. So now let's do the move, listening to the impulse to breathe and centering, aligning, allowing, and feeling that when they push back on us, we're just there. They can push all they want and we're just there, not, not there. Okay? Boom, and we're there. And then just stay in connection with them and see where the easiest, most natural way to move in relationship to them is. Now, it's really great with a real physical partner because it's obvious when you're with them. It's obvious when you're wrong. It's not necessarily obvious how to get with them at the beginning, but after a minute or two, you can feel it. Now you have to make it up in a way and use an imaginary. So you have to imagine where there's energy, where their energy is growing and how you might move with that energy, okay? So again, I'm just doing a off the line and a little bit of a blend here. In this case, I'm catching into the elbow of the person. I can feel there's a dip in the elbow. I'm taking them down a little that way. 
I'm not trying to throw yet or anything. I'm just starting to feel that, you know, in this case, I can feel their arm going up. I'm going to move under the elbow and bring it around this way. And where your uge goes or whether this is real or none of that matters. If you're having fun doing the movement, pretending, whatever it is, that's good. And if you're doing your practice that really matters, balancing your masculine and feminine, being a couple that gets along well with itself, if you're breathing or in harmony with that aspect of the breath that you don't usually pay attention to, and it's not unconscious, it's actually a consciously connected, both parts are there, or you're putting feeling into your music, as it were. Since I have a question. Please. Um, you're saying look for the impulse to breathe, but I'm more in line with that. Um, I just want to, I want to be breathing. I want to be sure I am breathing. And, and um, you know, over the years, I've sort of come to the conclusion that I am breathing. I, I sort of developed that by humming while I trained. Because I knew if I was humming, I had to be breathing. I had to have something coming in. I just lost you. All right, the rest of you hearing him? No, that happened to him before. So he's going to reboot. OK. Well, I'm, I'm going to come back to your question when your sound comes. I was going to say, I want an answer. I'm, in, I'm invested in this, too. <laughs> okay, give me the question once more, please. Just the end, the last part of the question. What is it you're asking? I, I think he may still be frozen, Sensei. Jim's had some problems with his feet. He's still frozen. Uh, see, earlier today. All right. All right. All right. So let's go just a couple more minutes. So I'm moving, and my again, my sense here is that I've got that kind of presence where they pushed on me. If I wanted to move, I could move in harmony with them, but I, I'm not vulnerable to them. I'm not victim to these feelings. I'm actually in a position where I can start to do whatever, okay? And so I'm going to change my move now. Instead of this, I'm going to bring my hand up as if I was going to, uh, you know, just wipe my head or something. As I move off the line, I'm going to bring it up and brush their hand by, just, just a slightly different movement here, uh, upward and over. And I don't really care which move you do. You could feel any kind of movement at all with your partner. Uh, and that's the beauty of imaginary partners is they, they work so well in harmony with you. This is a practice that I like to use um, to develop this, oh, since they said, Stillness in stillness is not true stillness. Only stillness in motion is true stillness. And I don't think he's talking so much physical motion, but he was saying being able to maintain this standing on the floating bridge, this unified field of presence, this connection between the masculine and feminine or two aspects of your breathing or whatever. When changes are happening in your life, you know, when you are cutting lettuce or to recognize your state and then do whatever you want to call correcting or connecting or aligning, allowing, appreciating what's going on for you. So to me, those are the fundamental practices that you'd like to do when you start the car, when you pick up the phone, when you turn on your computer, uh, certainly when you're playing your classical pieces or whatever your art is or whatever your mechanical thing that you like to do or when you're cooking or whatever. There's this state of being that you're working on. Um, yeah, I'm a dancer. I love moving. So, uh, but being able to hold that connection to the breath and that feeling that, uh, you know, the unliftable, that you just, they couldn't, they couldn't lift you up if they wanted to. That sense, now this is a funny application, I'm sure, but, when I work on my classical guitar, or I'm trying to learn the trumpet, which is the hardest thing I've ever done, um, 
I play little exercises where I imagine somebody trying to come under my elbow and push it up, and I, I try and stay in that state where I'm still grounded and connected. I'm sure you have something that you do, whether it's typing at your computer or watching television or, you know, certainly when you're driving because that's more active. Uh, if you just imagine somebody coming up and lifting your elbow or, or pushing on your shoulder or whatever, and watch yourself shift into that state. Is everybody with me on this one? Yeah? No problems? All right. So if you can find those practices, not only will it completely change your Aikido when you come back into the dojo and do your things from this state rather than, you know, the trying to do it person or letting the... Uh, um, I can't find the word. It's just gone from me. Ambitiousness. You know, kind of, and just and being able to operate in this state. So uh, my feeling is, is that, you know, we have an idea of how the technique should go, how we should, I, I'm not sure what you want to say, but how we should play the, the particular song or how we should, uh, cook a certain meal or something like that and it's like uh or whatever winning the game would mean in our sports you know things or something like that but i'd say uh if you're in a place where you're listening like you're listening to the impulse to breathe as if it were a message you're listening to the resistance in your partner as it were and this may sound a little funny at first but uh you're listening to the lettuce <laughs> or the salad or the dough of the bread or whatever your baking thing is you know you're listening on uh, what there's some famous soccer player whose name you might know i'm not a big sports fan i don't keep track much but he said uh, how do you do it and he said um, i don't play the ball i play the field you know i'm in a larger state of awareness and um and then that i think became kind of a standard and uh now it's probably a direction to give all the kids when they come to play. But at the time when he said it, it was like, oh, wow, what, a, what an insight. And, uh, and I think as you start to do these exercises, this is what's really important to me for you, is that you'll start to notice, oh, I could, and you pick the game, I could breathe a little deeper, or I could relax a little more, uh, I was saying to Bo a little earlier, you know, uh, I'm probably one of those people who needs to learn or practice to speak a little less, speak a little softer. Some of you may need to speak up a little more, speak a little more frequently or speak a little louder or whatever, but it doesn't really matter what the, the issue is. Left, right, there's a center line, there's a place of balance. Now, that doesn't mean that you always stay there. It means that it's a place that you recognize and you operate from. You don't stay there all the time, but even this position has a certain balance to it. If you're feeling where you are and you start to move in harmony with what's going on and then whatever wants to come through you, um, you know, uh, and there's one more piece here. It's like, um, I'm trying to think of who it would be, and I, I'm too old probably for most of you to, to give you a current reality, but but um, I'm just, I, I'm, I'm thinking about somebody who did a, a song in a particular way, and then everybody who did it kind of sang the song like that, and then somebody came out and did a completely different version of it. One of the songs I love is called um, Cry Me a River, it's an old jazz standard, and everybody does it sort of like Julie London did it, sort of, or something like that. Uh, and I, I think I'm going to leave it with this part of it. It's like, go ahead and, and if you haven't heard the song, go listen to Julie London or any of the old jazz standards to it. And then go listen to Joe Cocker to it. It's like, it's not even the same song, but it's just totally beautiful. It's totally whatever. So uh, when O Sensei, I think, why don't you sit down and we'll, we'll chat for just a couple minutes now. And um, maybe we'll exercise. I think you've got the basic pattern you know, and uh, you know it's not great that you know it. It's nice, but it's not great unless you actually 
do some practices with them. Even sitting here, you can be listening to the impulse to breathe. You can be seeking the origin and feeling and awareness of where the spiritual force that makes you alive is coming from. And um, each of you in your own way can bring forth whatever it is that well, Sensei called it accomplishing your bestowed mission. So it's finding a way to share with someone uh, that you honestly didn't really enjoy the movie that much, but maybe you're happy that they enjoyed it. And maybe you can learn something from them about why they enjoyed it. And maybe you'll go to the next movie looking in a different way or something that you can stay in a constant state of growth and development and serve for the completion of the universe. Hmm. So I think there's um, a lot more we could play with here, but I, I'd like to pause for a minute and just see what you might share. Uh, what's going on for you? Uh, anything you want to say about your experience? And, and of course, if there are questions, we'll do our best to deal with those as well. I have a question, but I think I've talked a lot. Anyone else want to go first? Well, I can make a comment. It's, Sweet, it's yeah. not really a question. You know, when you were uh, talking about Im imagine that someone supporting your arms or, you know, when you're driving or when you're well, I find that slows me down. I don't know how to explain it. It slows my reaction time. If that makes any sense. Don't do it when you're driving. Then. I'm not. <laughs> but, but, but someplace where you can afford to be slowed down, like when you're writing or typing or something on the computer or something, you know, or probably a place where you probably could afford to be slowed down is when you're eating. Yeah. You know, so, and, and again, these are just suggestions. When you start listening to your own inner teacher, you'll find ways to say, uh, let me come back and say, if everybody kind of enjoyed when they listened to the impulse to breathe, that shift to, I'm going to call it a finer dimension or a more unified field of awareness, um, you'll find your own ways to approach that state. You know, you'll find your own, the Aikikami, if you will, or the force, or your inner teacher um, will say things to you. And let me tell you a little story here that if this will help. Because uh, I think, you know, you may be expecting something dramatic, and maybe it's not. Maybe it's very subtle. But Osensei used to say that the Aikikami would wake him up in the middle of the night and take him out in the garden and teach him Aikido movements. Hmm. Now, I don't think he was picturing ghosts or, you know, whatever, was hallucinating, uh, you know, anything particular. I think it was just, he just kind of get this sense of like, hmm, he'd go out and he'd try something or he'd do something. It would just come to him. And I'd say, and if there's nothing there, then it's time for listening. Listening to the impulse to breathe is always a place to start. See where it takes you. Um, I think the Kami is always talking to you. And what, I'm, what I've been saying now is it's your art now. Well, Sensei's gone. You may be able to reach him on the other planes, and I encourage you to do so. Um, and or any way that it works for you to enhance your art. But it's your art now. And, you know, your teacher, I think, can help show you pieces and things that should help enhance your ability to listen to that inner voice or higher self or, you know, again, the words get really crazy here because we're talking about something that we don't actually, we haven't really developed the language for. Mm -hmm. We stumble around. So uh, what I call uh, extraordinary listening or generous listening or something to that voice and just play with, I mean, why do you, why do I pick up the trumpet and not the tuba and not the saxophone, not the piano, not the whatever? Mm. I don't know if I can tell you, but I know that that's the instrument I wanted to play. Uh, was it because I like Louis Armstrong? Probably. But, um, you know, why do you, and I don't know what you do, why do you play golf? Why do you, um, 
Is that Jamie? Yeah. Or do you play golf? Why do you? Um... I'm, here. I'm here. Hi, Richard. Yeah. Happy How you doing? Time. You should know it. <laughs> you know, each of us in our own way is called mm. to our mission. And uh, the problem is that, you know, probably you had an experience with someone who thought you should do something that they thought you should do. Uh, you were really lucky if you had an experience with someone who said, well, what is it that interests you and helped you do that? Mm -hmm. But I would say as you start to be able to do that for yourself, then you start to be able to do that for everyone that you're involved with. And as you, the words here I get struggled with, but as you more authentically be, come into presence with yourself, as you are more authentic with the person that you're with, even if you didn't like the movie, um, but without doing it in opposition to them, without anything other than just exploring your own, uh, I want to call it bestowed mission because that, that phrase works for me so well, but just doing what interests you, following your own joy and interest. And what are the things that help you do that? And I think a lot of the, the sense of strength that O Sensei gave us was the strength to be able to follow that, to do our dance the way we do our dance, to join into the symphony playing our part, not somebody else's part, playing the instrument we'd like to play, not the instrument someone else thinks we should play. Hmm. And and finding a way to do that. And that doesn't mean that you never compromise or it's like I said, you know, we all stop at the red lights. It's not that we want to stop. We, just, we work together. We work in harmony with other people. But um, but that doesn't mean we've forgotten where we were going. That doesn't mean we lose our journey to complete what we've come here to do. And I don't want to make that some kind of burden. I want to go back to just think about what you love, get in harmony with it, and I'm pretty sure you'll enjoy it. So I, I think, you know, I'm kind of, again, inclined to stop with my layout and say, talk to me, if you'd like. And if not, we can sit and listen to the impulse to breathe, and I'm, I'm good with that. I have a question about that impulse to breathe. So I, I was doing the, the turn, and I like your, your shadow of your weight going into the earth that's very similar to Tai Chi rooting. And I'd never done right. that with my Tenkan or my footwork before. It's, and right. in the opposite of, of uh, Bogdan, I found it sped me up. I found that it made my movements crisper and clearer, but I lost that connection to my breath. I like when I was doing it slow, I could feel that impulse to breathe. I could feel it and I was aware of it. And then as soon as I rooted and put it all into the ground, I felt a connectivity, like I could feel my body working as a unit, but I lost that specific voice. I lost that specific, you know, impulse to breathe. I'm just wondering, am I doing something wrong or am I? No, you're, you're paying attention and that's what you should be doing. You're noticing what's working and what's not. And that's what you should be doing because if you'll simply notice how you feel mm. and I'd come back to, you know, in terms of, aligning your structure with the force of gravity. Just notice it. You don't really have to do anything. You, if you just start to notice it, you'll notice that your system kind of naturally moves into a more aligned state. Okay. It, it, like the breathing goes on. And yet if you can connect your attention to that, then you start to be able to allow your musculature at a whole other level. That's also true when you align with your spiritual self, or in my case, I align with the trumpet. Mm. So I'm able to allow myself to play the trumpet, you know, whatever, whatever it leads you to in other realms besides the physical, but the physical is a great place to start. And so I come back with the metaphor of like, well, slow your heart down. Most of you would look at me like, you know, unless you've done yoga like that, you wouldn't know what I was talking about or mm. think I was you know, teasing or something. But if I said, slow your breath down, nobody had any problem with that. And I guarantee if you slow your breath down for 10 breaths, probably three, your heart's going to start to slow down, right? 
Now you can get closer and closer to that direct connection. So let me come back to your comment for a minute. Uh, I'll go back to a musical metaphor, but I'm sure there are other ones. I'm a um, musician. I like musical metaphors. They work for me. <laughs> all right. What instrument? Do you play? Uh, I play drums um, and I play the berimbau. What? The berimbau, uh, like the capoeira stringed bow. Oh, capoeira, sure. Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, let me use that keyboard for a sure. minute. But it could be on any, it could be a paradiddle. Um, so you learn, uh, you know, C, D, E, F sharp, mm -hmm. G, or whatever. You learn a scale or part of a scale or something like that. Usually when you learn it, and if you're smart, when you learn it, you'll do it very slowly. If you do it faster than you're comfortable, you're going to pick up a certain tension of trying to accomplish it. And if you practice slow, you'll learn it without that tension building in. Does that make mm -hmm, sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then what I want to say is, um, you know, Segovia used to be, he was the classical guitar master. Um, he, he used to be very into just doing it slow until you could play it perfectly. Mm. And all he ever worked on. And, um, so you never work on speed, but if you, you get start to get it perfectly, you just, without thinking about it, you start to play it faster. And then you can play it faster without that tension in your body. Okay. So now let me bring in one more piece. So then generally when you learn piano, that's why, you know, I'm, it's also true with the drums. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I'm, I, I play with the drums, but I'm, I'm not good enough to call myself a drummer or speak to you as clearly about it. But, but usually you learn the scale with one hand, then you learn the scale with the other hand, then you start to play them together. And then when you can play them together, then you start to pick up the speed of playing them together. So well, all I'm saying is in terms of your, you know, having fun with your Christmas, as soon as you notice that you lost the breathing, you did a great job. Now you can go back and keep noticing, oh, I lost my breathing because after a while, the fact that you've lost your breathing will be conscious while you're doing the movement and you'll start connecting to your breathing. If you go to do a technique and you realize, oh God, I'm way forward, that's good. It's not bad that you're forward. It's good that you noticed it. And if you keep noticing it, your body will start to do, and you don't even need to think or talk to yourself about this. People who don't understand anything other than practicing the techniques because they want a stronger knee cue mm -hmm. start to get more centered because that's the way you get a stronger knee cue. Mm -hmm. And I just think if you knew that you were doing that, then you could practice centering and a knee cue at the same time although eventually it's probably one and then the other, and eventually you do them together, all of a sudden you're starting to play a very different sounding piece than either hand could play separately. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But you generally can't learn them both at the same time, and you certainly can't do it at a high speed. Yeah. I think you learn the breathing, you learn the movement, you start to bring them together. And this division and unification, it's like uh, if we were going to do our movements, and I'm kind of exaggerating here, I start by moving the hand, then move the hand with the elbow, then the hand and the elbow and the shoulder, then the hand and the shoulder and the torso. You start to unify the divisions. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you find what you need to work on at the moment or what calls you the trumpet or the dirambao or whatever it is. And you follow that out in such a way that um, it will lead you to the next thing. You know, I mean, I think for me with the drum, I just, if I can get the, the one and the three with the bass drum and the snare drum going, or the, mm -hmm. you know, then I can add the three with the hi-hat and then start to play with a little interpolation in between, you know, you just build it slow and easy. So what you're saying is exactly right. Nothing's wrong okay. uh, except for um, this tendency that we have to think that we should be something other than what we are mm. or that somebody told us that, you know, I love that one guy said, um, you know, how many people here can sing? I was in a large group of 30 people or something. I think it was a business session or something. And, you know, the business people, whatever. And and um, I think there might have been one or two people that raised their hands, you know. And he said, you know, isn't that curious? Because if I ask a group of five-year-olds who can sing, everybody raises their hand. Everybody knows happy birthday or, 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 or 
you know, but adults think that you're supposed to sing like Mario Lanza or, or Pavarotti or something before you can call it singing. Mm. And well, that may be true on a certain level, and you're certainly probably not going to get paid for it in that sense. But for you to be able to enjoy singing a song or singing, I'm sure all of you sing along with the radio or, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, but you may not think of it as singing and yet it brings you that joy. If the joy was primary, what a different perspective we have on all the work that we do. That's very helpful. Thank you. What was the name of that musician that said, start slow? I didn't catch it. Um, uh, Segovia, Andre Segovia is a classical guitarist. That's it. Guitarist. But uh, if you want to, and I'm trying to remember his name now. Oh, God. Forgive me, but I think you can find it if you look up the talent code. Sure. Um, I'm thinking Daniel. So, anyway, talent code. Um, this guy did a study on uh, tennis schools. Soccer uh, school and um, violin schools, and uh, you know there's more here, and I, I just have a little bit of this. But he's got a bunch of videos out, and of course he's got a book out called The Talent Code. And um, uh, Daniel Cole, and Cole, thank you. And um, he said basically, the musicians who were the best <laughs> had learned is really, really slow. And let's talk about how extreme this is. They said that um, if somebody can recognize the piece that you're practicing, you're practicing it too fast. I got to tell you, it's tremendously helpful to me in terms of uh, my, and if you don't mind my calling it singing, um, it, you know, I tend to rush over and my, my, what they call intonation hitting the right note um, was pretty sloppy, pretty rough. Uh, and get away with it because as one guy said, you didn't have to sit through clearly for people to get what you're saying, but you know, they can interpolate it. But when I started to slow it down, my intonation just got so much better. And, and I never got close to slowing it down to the point where people would recognize it. So I'm a real, uh, you know, like I said, I like to talk too much. I like to talk too fast. I eat too fast. You know, I'm one of those people not a type A, type AAA, you know. And so um, that's why the Aikido and this yoga and all that has been so so valuable for me. But anyhow, the other one was the tennis players and the same story. They would get them to practice the movement in a slow way. So you would get the connection between the hand and the hip, you know, and the hip producing the movement through the shoulder and, um, and the other one was the soccer players, and it was particularly uh, the Brazilian soccer players. And uh, they, he went back and he found out that they ended up playing on a really small field, which, if you will, in a certain way, is like playing slowly or something like that. So I think if you just research the talent code a little bit, you'll get some more information on that. And really, I would just say take anything you do and play with doing it slowly and then building it up. Um, we were one time, I'm trying to think, what were we doing? We were in a basketball court in a gym and uh, probably doing an Aikido class or something. And the basketball coach comes in and uh, they're about to start, you know, we're gonna, we have to go to their practice. And he says, um, you want to know how to shoot a basket? And I'm always, you know, game for kind of what's somebody going to show me? What's important to somebody else? And... Um, I'm going to stand back so you can see me a little bit. But um, he said that the movement was here. It's here. You get the ball in here. Here, you know. And he said, and then you uncoil the body. The body. And then the last part is the arm shooting the basket. And and uh, I thought, um, I did a transcription of the Joe Katas back then. And the, this was before I had met this guy. And my instructions, besides showing that this hand goes here and you do this, you can move forward and do this strike or whatever, um, was prepare the base 
you know, your legs, your hands, your, I'm sorry, your legs and your feet position. Um, prepare the movement. And that meant, you know, putting your hands and everything in the right position and then uncoil the strike or whatever it was. And I thought, God, this guy is teaching us Aikido here. This is really great. And I think you'll find if you go back to your Aikido, um, that the people who are good have a great base connection. Their feet move really well. The people who progress slowly or don't seem to get it, they're, they're too caught up in the upper half and they never get to that gravity shadow. They don't even really get their footwork really that comfortable. It's always, um, you know, the head moving the foot. It, it's like it has this, and when the foot moves and the body moves, it's just a very, very different quality of being that happens there. And then we would take that back and say, for those of you who play in that world, um, you know, it's the problem with a lot of the business uh, issues that come up is that you've got somebody at the top directing everybody else what to do instead of listening, letting the base, the people who are doing the actual work, guide you in terms of how it works. And uh, God, what's the new one? Uh, Turn the ship around. Have you guys heard of that? Ah, what's the guy's name? I talked to him the other day. Uh, really nice guy, easy to talk to. Um, he was a, a admiral in the Navy and they gave him the worst ship in the fleet and uh, he, you know he, they eventually became awarded the best ship and the, the best submarine in the fleet and um, and one of the main things that he changed the first thing he changed was you know the officers are here to serve the enlisted people not order them around how do we help you get your job done well they completely transformed the game the other piece back to our aikido work is he said, we took the word they out of it. You can only use the word we. You can't say they ordered the wrong part. Say we ordered the wrong part. Anyhow, these couple little tricks or something started to turn the whole world around. David Marquette. And all of it. Can... I'm sorry. The, the author is um, David L. David Marquette. Marquette, thank you very much. And um, I started, I wrote to him, you know, he said, you know, Feel free to write. So I wrote him and told him about Aikido and stuff. And um, he and his partner, I can't remember, I have their name somewhere, but Mike something, uh, you know, got back in touch. We had some great conversations. And, and uh, you could just see that, I mean, to my mind, what we're learning here, what we're working on here are principles that absolutely could transform the world. And um, people are getting little pieces of it here and there. Uh, and I think even the people who do quote unquote form school, uh, it starts to happen to them. I think that Osensei created the movements or the Aikikami created the movements and gave them to Osensei in such a way that, you know, uh, learning to do Taino Henko or, or even, you know, our uh, Nikyos and all the spiraling techniques, Sankyo, whatever, all the Kokinages, um, as opposed to the, you know, the, hard block, counter punch uh, mentality, it will start to change the way you interact with people. But I would say if you're conscious that that's what you're doing, then um, what, what I would say is your return on investment is a lot higher. And we all know it because we've watched some people come in and they progress really quickly. And we've watched other people and they don't. And I know certain people have natural talent. They sing better. Certain people are faster. They can throw a ball further. There's all that going on. But there's also this place of um, kind of where you're coming from in the practice. I studied with Peter Ralston. I, anyone in the martial arts would know him. Um, he was world champion and um, best fighter I've ever seen. Better than I trained at Croppoware with a three-time heavyweight world champion, and, and he was the most beautiful guy I've ever known. But, um, you know, uh, Peter's thing in a way was just so, uh, I'm quite going to say it at this point, I'm kind of losing that. It, it was just, he, he was,
I don't think I can quite bring back how to say it right now. Please forgive me. I just, uh, he, there was a, he called his thing effortless power. And it was just, it was such a naturalness to his, to his style. And he was saying, you know, he never blocked. And um, I couldn't make sense of that at first. And then he said to me, well, when you block, the best you can do is, is come up even. He would just move off the line and strike. And he was just unbelievable. So anyhow, I think that that this sense of working in a in a different way, if we start to catch that and we bring it to everything that we do, we can share a lot with the world. And uh, so these fundamentals are the way that I move myself from my, um, what I call my stinking, expletive deleted attitude uh, to kind of a, a more harmonious space, to a place where I'm, Really, what did you like about the movie? Not you stupid idiot, that was a crummy movie. And and uh, go back to your breath, go back to the origin of the source or the impulse. And you can feel the shift immediately, don't you? you know, so the trick is inculcating that practice in yourself to remind yourself. Uh, and here's what I'll say about it is that uh, in the beginning, you know, you could be more centered or you could have gone back to the impulse to breathe or however you want to talk about the practice. And if you can think about a bad situation you've been in and you go back and you run the movie again and you do the little exercise, you almost always say something better, you handle it better, you do whatever. And um, I guess the way I'd say it is how many times have you had an argument with someone and thought about the exact right thing to say about four hours later. And then can we start to move it towards four minutes, four seconds? And the way we do that, you know, since he said my students think I don't lose my center, but that's not true. I simply recognize it sooner and I go back, I get back quickly. That's all it is, it can't calm the spirit, return to the source. This world is not going well because all the problems in the world exist because people have forgotten that everything emanates from a single source. Call in the spirit, return to the source. I'm getting close, but I'm open to any other comments and questions and insights and stories about how you've used Aikido. I've got one. <laughs> uh, some, what you were saying about music and slowing down your practice um, really hit me, especially that's something that uh, I discovered that I related in my session this morning that I wouldn't have known, wouldn't have done unless I were sort of forced into it. I went to one of these week long music camps to do an advanced finger style blues guitar workshop. And I get there and the instructor turns on the metronome and we go. And I thought, is this the beginning class? Did I screw up? Like I, <laughs> Am I in the right place? And it that's how we practiced by God. And by the end of the week, we were able to play well at a reasonable speed instead of blundering through it badly with tension, making mistakes and pauses. Um, and it was it was a real revelation. And I've used I've applied that to other skills, including Aikido. Don't don't rush your way through it badly. Do it as correctly as you can as slowly as you need to and only when you've got it bump the speed up a little bump the speed up a little and it comes a lot faster you could have told me that all day long but until i got locked in a room in west virginia for a week <laughs> I, no, I, I totally, it's hard for me too and, and, uh, but it's just beautiful and i'd come back and say you know if you if you people do their tai chi and i'm not talking about the people who do the um, uh, forgive me, imitation Tai Chi, where they're doing the moves and, you know, it's, 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 uh, they're doing a dance form or something, the dojo ballerinas or whatever, but, but the, the guys who, who could, you know, uh, knock you across the room or something, but all their movements were so, you know, a lot of people just not understand how that could possibly produce the power that it does. And, um, being able to, to work at a speed that you decrease the tension and allow more flow in your space uh, 
Yeah, that's a discipline I, I need more of. There's no question about it. It's a hard one for me. But it, it's that in a certain way, well, yoga and Tai Chi were so good for me. Because yeah, I love Aikido. You know, it's fast and it's intense. And uh, But I, just, anyhow, thank you for what you shared. You should be listening to the impulse to breathe while we're waiting to see if someone else wants to say something. I was just going to say, after studying Tai Chi in China, where they are very holistic about it, of, you know, you want to have that same sort of look at your uh, shadow going into the ground sort of rooting and have the flow within your movement and keep it agonizingly slow and think about, you know, ripping the guy's throat out. You know, there's a lot to keep track of, but I feel like you you take to it very easily just with what I, I've seen here. You know, like it just crosses over so much. For sure. And yet I would say, you know, anybody who can play the drums, I mean, you're doing three or actually four things often at once. You know, it's like, but there it is. There's something in the middle of it that's going on. And that is now a little cosmic here and saying that's the universal pulse. I mean, we'd say the rhythm of the song, but there's, there's a larger rhythm that we're all part of. And when we start to connect in that way, we start to be able to bring all these multiple aspects of our life into kind of a, you know, the way a good drummer brings all four, you know, two arms and two feet into this just amazing experience, you know. And I think what always got me about music was why is it that somebody does something like that and it just completely changes who you are, how you're I mean, it's just the power of that. And, and uh, you know, for the people who are never going to enter a dojo, and most people are not, um, music is really, I guess my story was that, you know, I was listening to, you guys are probably not old enough to know who Perry Como was. Oh, my grandfather's favorite. <laughs> Anyhow, and all of a sudden, you know, I'm listening to this stuff in 1950, whatever it was. And all of a sudden, I, I probably, I lived in, grew up in Minneapolis. I guess WLS from Chicago. Every now and then, in the middle of the night, you would get these crossovers in the waves. And Little Richard comes on. And it's just like, whoa! Mm. You know, and I thought that just changed my life. I thought if I could make people feel like he made me feel, I, that's what I want to do. Anyway, somebody, please. We're going to wrap it up soon here for that. Jamie, yeah, I'd love to hear from you. We can't hear you. No, no, we're not hearing you. Are you muted? I don't think they're muted. No, I'm not hearing you yet. Oh, it's very frustrating. It just happens. I don't know. Yes. No, you're gonna have to call me and tell now me. Now I'm invested. <laughs> <laughs> I could have sworn I heard you earlier. Yeah. Well, you definitely, you know, had the uh, little if, Richie if, effect if on me. This is very, very eye-opening, and I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, again, I, I come back to you all, and I say, you know, why are you training, why are we training? What is it that we're really doing? And I know each of us has our own interests. Mm. Uh, we all like different flavored ice creams or whatever, but but you know, we're there for other we go in the store and we order something different. But but at the same time, there's something that we all look at each other and we go, you know, I feel it. I don't know, what is it? You know? And so to me, it's like uh, my joke about it would be uh you know, we see when we started, we started with Bob. We were in a church and uh, we didn't have mats. There was no picture of our sensei. There were no geese. There were no Japanese words. We didn't throw. We were doing aspects of it, but, you know, and then it kind of grew into whatever more and more. And then as it kind of got popular, all of a sudden, everybody was into all the Japanese terms and being really Japanese. And, and I thought there's nothing wrong with that. But that's not the art. Mm. That's not use what's you know what's what in there in Japanese there's some exquisite concepts that can help us understand aspects of the art but you know 
speaking Japanese or acting Japanese or dressing Japanese, as somebody said, you know, uh, would it be different to you if you came into the dojo and everybody shook hands and wore sweat clothes? Because in Japan, that's basically what they're doing. You know, so just trying to separate out. I, I'm not and I'm anything against people who are into the Japanese culture, and I, I am too. I just don't want to confuse what we're studying in terms of the art with some of the things that we love in other areas. God, I'm wondering. So if, if I, if I, think, uh, I, uh, I just want to say I, I appreciated the metaphor of the, the movie and the opinions on the movie. Um, one of the things that, that has been important for me in Aikido is its application to conflict management. And, uh, and along that, <clears throat> along that line, um, uh, it's been a, bit of a study of, of uh, self-exploration and self-awareness. And so the, the ability to hold one's center and still be curious and, and, and uh, open alive to, to the, to another, uh, an, another person. Um, one of the things I talked about earlier today was, you know, that I, I'm often faced in, in my, day to day. I'm, I'm a litigation lawyer and a mediator and conflict resolution skills teacher. Uh, and with my clients, particularly my litigation clients, uh, I am often coaching them around. It's okay to hear the other, hear and understand the other party. In fact, in fact, we have to, uh, and doing so does not mean that you necessarily agree. Um, I think that, uh, in certain contexts in our day to day, we have, we, we've developed this very binary sense. And it, there's a, there's sometimes a feeling of if I let that other perspective in, I'm, I'm giving something up, I'm losing something. And, and so it's the ability to, to recognize that, no, I, I can maintain mine and still entertain yours. As a matter of fact, I can even maintain mine and still, and hold yours with the same kind of respect and regard that I do for my own. That's a whole nother level beyond what, <laughs> what I'm often coaching my clients on. But um, anyway, so I, I, I really appreciated that particular metaphor and uh, uh, it, it resonated. No, that's beautiful. Do you know Tony Piazza? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not for anyway, sure. Tony was a, a friend and a student. He taught me mediation and he had studied under Bob and it was, he said it was Aikido that made him mediator of the year or whatever. Um, I got to work in uh, Bosnia and in Cyprus and in uh, Northeast Asia with some different peace building associations and stuff. And, uh, you know, very much in resonance with what you're saying here. And I think it's sort of just the opposite. And I'm kind of my, if I can just be a little flippant as I can't control myself from not being, you know, it's like when it comes to like music, well, we don't, I mean, mixing African music with Western music, you know, that's what creates rock and roll. You know, it's like, we don't even mind, and, you know, who, in the modern world, certainly, I don't know where y'all are, but if, you know, we're here in California, I mean, California cuisine is nothing but a mixture of, you know, every kind of cooking that's ever happened, you know, but for some reason, when we get to politics and religion, the understanding of how powerful and beautiful it gets lost. So I'm with you and trying to help people have the courage to listen. Yeah, that's that's a challenge, but a very high level. Jamie, can we hear you yet? Yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Ah! Okay, it's just great. static. I don't know who said it. First of all, I just want to say hi, Richard. It's great to see you. Uh, I really enjoyed listening very, very much. Uh, it's it's kind of nice. You know, after all these years, it's like um, you know, there, there's one mountain, and we've just been kind of going and it gets like so similar at the top um it's just just really right. really nice many times of mount fuji yeah yep. absolutely Tomorrow, actually i'm going to be doing a session on uh, teaching the intangible and there are so many things that you said that are are so um you know kind of um in line aligned resonant all that that stuff um 
and I was, uh, uh, well, I have to mention Perry Como. <laughs> my brother had some Perry Como. Sh- <laughs> so, so white shoes. You know, my brother, the senator, right, had uh, had Como shoes, so that was fun. Um, but uh, what else? I, um, you know, the the beat and the drumming. I, I do some African drumming and taiko drumming, and in Aikido, you know, the um, the moment of, uh, of the, the dropping in and taking a moment for center for ground and before doing anything. And to me, there's like a beat. It's like um, you know, energy seems to travel in waves and. Um, uh, musical waves, sound waves, and there's just like this moment of a beat, and then, uh, and then we move, and then we, you know, do a technique, then we blow our horn, then we make a golf swing, then we whatever it is we do, you know, then we pedal the bicycle. But otherwise, it's like this. It's like yeah, that moment of the stop and the drop in is is beat. It's like picking up the beat of the energy, and then comes the flow, then comes the wave. I am. Um, I. We did a workshop at Tony Place in Hawaii one time, and you know, uh, Tony asked me about wanting to play the drum. We've got a conga drum. We wanted to do it, and I was able to give him this metaphor. I um, I lived in Hawaii for a while. Well, kind of learned to surf, kind of, and I I was there with, you know, everybody there seems like they're great surfers, you know. And I'm not, I can barely swim. So, uh, you know, I, I tagged along as best as I could. And I remember at one point I'm saying, God, learning to surf is the hardest thing I've ever done. That was before I picked up the trumpet. And um, and the guy I'm hanging out with is totally great surfer. He's going, God, it's the easiest thing I ever learned. And I was just like, I just, I was like in shock. I was going, well, what are you talking about? He said, well, I learned in Corpus Christi, Texas. I don't know if you understand about the waves there, but it's like he said, really, really small waves, hardly enough to get you to surf on, and really, really big boards. And then gradually you go to bigger waves and smaller boards. So I taught Tony, I said, you get the metaphor, you know, small waves, big boards. So I just said, just, you know, just give him one. One, two, three, four. And then start adding a three, and then start, you know, whatever. And I think if you can catch that, that will end up back to the, the same story about just doing it slow, just doing it easy. Just, um, you'd be surprised what you can accomplish in that way. And as the Buddha said, even by drops, the bucket is filled. So why don't we move towards wrapping up and just say, if there's anything out there, please share it. It's been great to hear you. Yeah. And so if there's any left, I'd, I'd love to make sure everyone gets a chance to continue what they like to, to share who you are in our community lessons terminology. Yeah. All right. I'm going to say we're probably good. Um, I think I made it clear, but let me re emphasize that um, I'm available if you have any questions if you want. Any of the information again, and uh, you know, we've got uh, the Moon Sense H channel if you want to go look at video. And uh, Bob's teaching on Friday nights and, and at 6 30 Pacific time. I'm doing a couple classes more on Saturday at 4 if you want any of the information. And I would just say, Bo, thank you very much for doing this. Thank all of you for being here. Thank you, Richard. And I do hope we. Doesn't bring me great to see you again.